Hello? Can you all of you hearing me, seeing me? Well, I welcome you to uh, this session. We have about 45 minutes where I'll be speaking on the Indian economy post COVID-19, uh, which has been a huge uh, transformational moment for all of us. Uh, and uh, I'll speak for about maybe 10 minutes, maximum 10 to 12 minutes. And I will take questions later. And I think we should make this session uh, more interactive, a little more interactive. So let's begin by just understanding what the economy is all about. Uh, any economy really moves on four engines. There is the investment engine. Uh, there is a consumption engine. There is an import engine and there is an export engine. Basically, these are the locomotives for an economy. If you invest more, you grow more. If you consume more, you grow more. And if you trade more, you grow more. Uh, now, unfortunately, what has happened? The entire economic situation uh, has gone for a toss uh, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the economy was decelerating uh, much before the crisis. In fact, we had uh, six consecutive quarters uh, of uh, declining GDP growth. Remember, uh, it's not GDP decline, but it is GDP growth decline. Uh, so growth was slowing. And what the COVID-19 has done is to accelerate the deceleration. So what was going down is now going down faster. And all experts and all projections are that this financial year, that is the year 2020-21, uh, is really a write-off as far as the economy is concerned. We may in fact even have negative growth. Uh, and the year after, which is the year 21-22, uh, we may recover. But, you know, if your economy is, is at a negative, any growth will appear to be positive. Uh, and therefore, we are expecting an economic recovery to take place, not in 2020-21, where growth is going to be negative, but in 2021-22, when uh, there is expected to be a recovery. Now, how will you recover? You will recover if there is consumption, if people go out, consume more, if they buy more consumer goods. Uh, it will grow. The economy will recover if investment takes place. Uh, now, who invests? It's governments who invest in infrastructure. It's private companies uh, that invest uh, in infrastructure and other economic activities. And of course, if you have exports, uh, world markets, you will undoubtedly begin to recover. So the entire uh, recovery hinges on number one, investment uh, by government and by private industry. Number two, it depends on consumption by you and me, by ordinary people consuming goods. Uh, and number three, it will depend on uh, exports. It will depend on how much we are able to export, how much we will make the world markets Revive. Now, unfortunately, the prospects for world recovery are not very positive, uh, and therefore uh, we will have to depend uh, almost exclusively on the domestic market. Uh, we will have India is a large domestic market, uh, and uh, we will have to depend uh, not so much uh, on uh, exports uh, as much as we will have to depend on increasing the purchasing power in the Indian economy so that Indian consumers end up buying more, consumption increases, and the economy goes up. Now, you know, this COVID economic crisis that has come, uh, it has, of course, uh, created a situation where we are all beginning to realize 
that investment in public health uh, is of paramount importance. So one of the consequences uh, of this um, crisis uh, is going to be a reorientation in public expenditure. Uh, and we have been found terribly wanting in terms of investment uh, in medical personnel, uh, in nursing personnel, in paramedical personnel, in hospitals, and so on. So therefore, uh, I think one of the consequences, one of the uh, effects or impacts uh, or spin-offs from this crisis is a recognition that we will have to invest very heavily on public health. We invest just about 2% or less than 2% of our GDP on public health. And this will have to go up double at least uh, if we are going to meet the new public health challenges uh, that, uh, uh, that the COVID-19 crisis has created. Now, there is a third crisis that has come along with the COVID crisis. Remember that the COVID-19 crisis is, of course, a crisis of public health, but it's also an environmental crisis. Uh, it's the way we deal with the environment. It's the way we deal with nature. Uh, if nature's ecological balance begins to get disturbed, uh, then nature hits back. Uh, that's what happened. I mean, for example, this whole Wuhan episode has been linked uh, to the existence of wet markets. And many of these viruses are zoonotic in nature. That means, uh, you know, we get them from, from animals or birds. Uh, and if, if we treat nature uh, in the manner in which we have treated in the past, then nature is going to hit back. So remember this COVID-19 crisis uh, is fundamentally a public health crisis, but it's got uh, created an economic crisis of uh, fundamental dimensions. And of course, it's a reflection uh, of the manner in which we have managed and dealt with nature and dealt with our natural resources, dealt with the environment, so to speak. So we have to use this COVID-19 crisis creatively to address problems of public health, to address problems of the economy, uh, uh, particularly uh, in the medium and small scale sector, which is the one that creates employment and jobs. And we have to use this crisis to reinforce and reaffirm our commitment to faster economic growth, but while protecting the environment. You know, almost 10 million uh, jobs have to be created every year. That is the extent of the number of people every year who enter the Indian labor force seeking jobs. Uh, and so the economy has to be turned around. Uh, it has to be turned around in a manner that creates jobs creates not necessarily only white collar jobs, but jobs in manufacturing, uh, jobs in agriculture. And of course, a large number of jobs will be created in agriculture and agriculture related activities like agro processing. One of the silver linings uh, in this crisis has been the performance of agriculture. Uh, the rains have been good so far uh, and uh, India is not facing food shortages as yet, although we have distributional problems uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis, but India does not face a problem of production. And therefore, to that extent, I think uh, we are um, in a relatively, you know, relatively good position as far as agriculture is concerned, although uh, the return of migrant labor uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, the fact that uh, market chains have been disrupted uh, because of transportation and logistics problems uh, will create problems ultimately for farmers. But unlike previous crises where the economy uh, has really done very badly because of agriculture, you know, uh, the last, you know, we had negative growth in India uh, in 87, 88. Uh, that in 80, 87, 88, we had a very bad drought. We had a negative growth. Uh, but this year, we are going to have negative growth 
not because of drought, but because of a collapse of industry uh, and uh, also uh, a, a very sharp deceleration in the growth of the services sector. So this uh, COVID crisis, uh, unlike previous crises, is not a crisis that is monsoon uh, or uh, drought or agriculture driven, but this is a crisis that has been driven by collapse of investment, collapse of consumption, uh, and collapse of economic activity. So to that extent, uh, this is a different crisis. But of course, uh, this COVID-19 crisis embraces the entire economy. Uh, and uh, everybody is looking not just at revival right now, but they're looking basically at survival. Now, whether you're a farmer, whether you're a migrant labor, uh, whether you're a worker in a factory, whether you're a small businessman or a medium businessman, you are today really looking at survival. How do you pay your wages? Uh, where do you get your salary from? Uh, you know, these are the basic questions that people are asking. And it's going to be uh, a fair amount of time before normalcy returns. Uh, however, as I said, and I'll conclude here, that 2020-21 uh, is undoubtedly going to be uh, one of the worst years for the economy. We're going to have a very sharp negative economic growth, a contraction, not an expansion, a contraction of economic activity. Uh, and we should not be fooled by the stock markets. Uh, in fact, there is very little relationship between the real economy and the stock markets. So don't, don't believe what the stock markets are telling you, uh, but go by the real economy. And in 2020, 21, the real economy is going to be uh, in very serious, serious difficulty and recovery uh, is going to be seen. The first rays of recovery will only be seen in 2021, 22. Uh, and that is, of course, uh, by the time we are hoping that a vaccine will become available uh, and uh, this pandemic would have run its first course and its second course. So uh, that's all I have to say formally. Uh, I think some of the questions uh, have already come. And so let me uh, address some of the questions. One of the most important questions that has been raised uh, is uh, what do we do about migrant labor? Uh, millions and millions of people have returned home. Uh, most of the migrant labor comes from Bihar, uh, Jharkhand, <coughs> Orissa, UP, uh, parts of Assam, you know, Eastern India contributes the bulk of migrant labor. And this migrant labor uh, works in Gujarat, Maharashtra, uh, large parts of South India, Delhi. <coughs> so migrant labor is a very serious issue. And uh, we will have to, uh, first of all, ensure that the livelihoods of the migrant workers uh, are met. Uh, cash transfers uh, has been talked about. Uh, I think that's one good way of ensuring some social security for them. Uh, but uh, in the long run, we will have to create conditions for the return uh, of the migrant labor uh, to economic activities because the jobs are in South India and Western India uh, and labor is in surplus is in eastern India and it's going to take a lot of time before we're going to create economic activity uh, in eastern India. Meanwhile we have uh, programs, social security and welfare programs like the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act uh, which uh, government has announced will be expanded and I hope it does get expanded to provide but this is employment of last resort. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, you know long-term employment, it's uh, distress employment. Uh, you cannot, you know, person can't be working on MG Narega for years. So it's distress employment, employment of last resort. That can be expanded to deal with the immediate problem of migrant labor. But I think uh, there's no question that the most uh, affected community uh, in India in terms of livelihoods has been migrant labor. Uh, who depend on daily wages, uh, who don't have any social security, who don't have <clears throat> any social infrastructure like housing or health care. And that is where I think uh, we really have to focus our attention. 
Uh, second question, what made India directly jump from agriculture uh, to service-based economy? Well, it's true that, you know, our service economy is about 57, 58% of our GDP and our manufacturing is somewhere uh, 16 to 17% of our GDP. But uh, I think, you know, these are really outdated definitions. Increasingly, uh, service in manufacturing uh, and services are getting interrelated. There's a lot of services uh, that is linked uh, in with manufacturing. Uh, and within manufacturing itself, you know, there have been many changes that have taken place. Uh, it is true, but having said this, it is true that we have not capitalized uh, on uh, international markets. We have not become the workshop of the world like China has become. Uh, we've become the back office of the world uh, because we prefer service jobs uh, to manufacturing jobs. Even in an area like garments, uh, in Bangladesh, which started off much later than India, uh, today Bangladesh's exports of garments is about $20 billion and India is about $15 billion. So even on garments, we have been, of course, that depends on low wages and Bangladesh wages are far lower than in India. In India, aspiration levels have improved. So wage rates have, have had to improve and that's a good thing. Uh, but in general, I think we've, uh, we've missed out on the international markets. Uh, we missed out on uh, scale uh, and manufacturing, scale of manufacturing. Uh, and we really became a world leader in the service sector of the economy, as everybody knows. Uh, but I think there is still scope. Uh, it's not a complete write-off. The nature of manufacturing has changed. We must recognize this. There is far more of a service input into manufacturing. Manufacturing in terms of old metal bashing no longer uh, you know, seems to be relevant. So we must grasp the true nature of manufacturing uh, uh, and also uh, look at all market opportunities that arise. Countries like Vietnam, countries like Thailand, uh, you know, uh, Southeast Asia, looking at uh, companies who are vacating China, uh, American companies, European companies, which are vacating China, Japanese companies, which are vacating China. And I think India does have an opportunity here uh, for, uh, for kickstarting uh, the manufacturing. We have a large manufacturing base. We have household manufacturing. We have informal manufacturing. All this, of course, you know, does not get reflected. Uh, in the manufacturing GDP numbers largely. So I, I, I have always argued for many years that the extent of manufacturing contribution in GDP is actually underestimated in India because of the nature of our manufacturing. Uh, but I think uh, the general point is that we need uh, you know, to look at manufacturing far more seriously than we have. The third question is, with the rise of protectionism, what reforms do you think? Uh, well, you know, I think uh, there is going to be, uh, it's not, uh, this uh, post-COVID globalization uh, is not going to be the same as pre-COVID globalization. Uh, globalization is going to be much more difficult. Uh, there will be trade barriers. There will be non-trade barriers also. Yesterday I was on a chat with the Europeans who are looking at, uh, you know, carbon, uh, how to how to introduce uh, taxes on export, on imports into Europe, which are carbon intensive in order to uh, deal with the problem of climate change. So there are all sorts of tariff and non-tariff barriers. And I think it would be unwise for India uh, to depend uh, too much on international trade uh, to revive the economy, too much to depend on foreign investment to revive the economy. I think fundamentally, uh, it is going to be the Indian market that is going to drive revival. Uh, it's going to be Indian investment that is going to drive revival. So I think foreign investment is important. We shouldn't neglect it. Uh, foreign trade is important. We should certainly make ourselves competitive. We should create an environment for foreign investment. But the magic keys, the jadu ki chari, uh, is not in foreign trade, is not in foreign investment. It is in uh, domestic investment, domestic trade, uh, uh, and that's where I think uh, we need to focus on. Uh, you know, uh, uh, psychologically, investment is not just 
uh, a physical exercise is also a psychological exercise so the investors require it's, it's all about sentiment so it's no point having a positive sentiment for foreign investors when indian investors uh, are do not have the confidence to invest in the indian economy so that's i think the real uh, the, the crux of the issue uh, I think the fourth question has come uh, in what way the Indian economy gained from opportunities. Well, I think, you know, you know, we should not look at it so cold bloodedly as opportunities. This is a crisis. This is an unprecedented crisis. We have to get our uh, act together, particularly in terms of public health. Uh, I think that's been uh, a big, big, big uh, sore point in this whole period that our hopelessly inadequate public health infrastructure has been shown up and i think we should uh, we should uh, use this opportunity uh, to revisit some of the priorities for public expenditure uh, and there is no question that as far as the union government is concerned or the state government is concerned health is has to occupy pride of place health is wealth wealth is not health but health is certainly wealth and i think that's uh, certainly one message from COVID-19 <coughs> that is that is very clear. Let's take the fifth question. Uh, do you think the COVID-19 will bring a permanent change? Uh, yes, I think it will bring about a permanent change. Um, it will bring about a permanent change. Uh, there is a lot of uh, thinking going on. Uh, I hope, uh, I do hope that uh, this uh, COVID-19 crisis will make us more sensitive to environmental issues. Uh, we in India have a habit of, uh, of speaking in favor of the environment. But when it comes to walking the talk, we are not very serious. We pray to our uh, rivers, we pray to our mountains, we pray to, you know, uh, we have, uh, we pray to Lord Ganesha, you know, who's got an elephant trunk, Vakratundam, uh, and, uh, you know, we pray to nature. Uh, but uh, when it comes to actual practice, you know, we say Ganga is Ma Ganga, but you know, we pollute and dirty the Ganga daily without any compunction, without feeling guilty. So I think one of the, one of, I hope certainly, one of the offshoots of this crisis is a far more serious approach uh, to dealing with the environment, uh, to the conservation of forests, to the protection of biodiversity, uh, conservation of water, uh, the need to deal with chemical contamination. Uh, you know, there is now evidence to show that uh, people who are living in polluted areas are far more at risk uh, to COVID-19 than people who are not living in polluted areas. So problems of air pollution, problems of water pollution, problems of deforestation, problems of, uh, <coughs> of chemical contamination, these are all issues that I think uh, are thrown up uh, and I think we should uh, take them far more seriously. Well, when one question uh, that has come here on my screen is how long will India take to become a five trillion economy? India will definitely become a five trillion dollar economy. I mean, it's a this is an arithmetical game. Uh, you know, we were a one trillion economy. We became a two trillion economy. We'll become a three trillion economy, and we'll grow. We'll become maybe you know, if not 2025, if uh, by 2030, if not 2030. Certainly by 2035. I mean, so I don't, I don't, uh, I don't attach too much importance to this number five trillion. Uh, people who keep talking of five trillion don't even know what a trillion is. How many zeros uh, are there in a trillion? A trillion is not even an Indian metric. You know, we talk of lakhs and we talk of crores. A trillion is not even an Indian metric. It's a, it's an American uh, metric. So I mean, yeah, we will become a five trillion dollar economy. Uh, we'll be a world's third largest economy in terms of purchasing power. But these are meaningless statistics as far as I'm concerned. A question to ask is, at a $5 trillion economy, what will be your per capita income? Uh, at a $5 trillion economy, your population uh, will be about 1.5, 1.6 billion. Uh, so your per capita income is still going to be about $2,000. You're still going to be uh, you know, a low middle income country. So this 5 trillion is a nice headline, uh, is a nice sort of a catchy thing, but it really is a meaningless statistic. And it is something that is inherent in the compounding process of GDP. Now, uh, 
let's shall we take some other questions well i have <clears throat> i have answered this question about 5 trillion dollar economy uh, one interesting question how to do economics for upsc <laughs> well uh, uh, i wish i knew the answer uh, but i think it's important to keep in touch with what is happening um, in uh, the economy to read the economic press certainly uh, read some good books uh, on the indian economy uh, you know uh, indian planning indian economy there are some very good books that have been written by by professors uh, it's important to keep in touch with what is happening and that the best way i can advise is uh, uh, to keep in touch through uh, through looking at uh, the the newspapers and the economic journals the economic and political weekly is a very serious academic uh, publication and that's very helpful for children uh, for for youth uh, preparing for public services well uh, uh, what what should be the plan um, there's a question here what should be the plan for our develop well you know the plan for our self reliance has always been the motto of indian planning uh, from 1950 Uh, self reliance in uh, hindi means atmanirbharta so atmanirbhar bharat is nothing new because uh, in from 1950 when the planning commission was set up and the first five year plan was uh, launched uh, in fact the first five year plan says the objective of planning should be self reliance a uh, self reliance in industry self reliance in agriculture self reliance in investment uh, self reliance in science and technology so self reliance Uh, has always been from the 1950s onwards uh, the the guiding light for indian economic policy well, that's not uh, that's nothing new i think what has changed is the mix between the public and private uh, up to the 90s up to the early 90s i think the private sector the public sector was the locomotive uh, for for investment in india uh, over the last 30 years that has changed the private sector has become the locomotive for change uh, we have not given up on the public sector banking for example continues to be in the public sector um, uh, and large areas of infrastructure steel power uh, roads railways continue to be in the public sector and they should be there is a logic uh, for the public sector but the mix of public private has changed in india's economic planning and today we are far more of a private sector driven economy Uh, than we were, say, 30 years ago, or even 20 years ago, uh, and that's in the nature of things. Uh, but one of the things that the COVID-19 crisis has thrown up uh, is that you cannot do without public investment. Ultimately, we're all depending on public hospitals. We are depending on public health workers. So, you know, in areas like health and education, uh, nutrition, particularly in the social sectors, uh, I don't think that can be privatized. Uh, those are areas in which uh, the union government and the state government uh, has to be uh, have to be far more proactive than they have i am seeing a large number of questions there are 400 questions i find but uh, i'm not able to answer all of them i'm trying to take each of them and trying to club them and 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 see you know what um, so i I've, i've answered the how to do economics do we need to study about for the upsc do we need to study about the world economy or is it well you need to know something of the world economy for the upsc but i think your priority is to learn about the indian economy frankly uh, about indian agriculture indian industry the indian services about indian planning i think that's uh, far more important i don't think the international economy is important something to know about the international economy but i think the focus should be to understand on the domestic economy now let's see what is the next question i have already answered this uh, then let's see uh, is the current rise in fuel prices a deliberate agenda well you know uh, the uh, fuel prices uh, the logic of fuel prices of course uh, going for a market determined system is that when international prices go up domestic prices go up when international prices go down domestic prices go down that is because you know we import over 80% of the crude uh, that we need to process we don't import much of products we don't import much of diesel and petrol but we import the crude 
uh, and which we refined to make petrol and diesel. Now, this is the logic of market uh, planning. Uh, when you are importing a large section of, uh, when you're when you're import dependent, then the uh, the guidepost for pricing should be international prices. So the logic is, if international prices go up, your prices go up. If international prices go down, your prices go down. Now, unfortunately, uh, the uh, oil, the petrol and diesel are milk cows, you know, for the government. Uh, uh, for the union government, uh, uh, every time it raises uh, fuel prices, it comes as a bonanza for the union government. It's like alcohol. Uh, alcohol is, uh, you know, is is a bonanza for the state governments uh, and for the union government. And these are not part of GST. Unfortunately, the fuel prices are not part of GST. Alcohol is not part of GST. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it is used as a milch cow. It's used as a common hen. You know, you can, you can tax whatever you want because ultimately the government's argument would be we need money. We need money for social welfare. We need money for migrants. We need money for treating COVID patients. And this is one way <coughs> tax revenues are not going up. And this is the only way we are going to get revenue. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it is a revenue. It is fundamentally, you're right, uh, Sabin Matthew, a fundamentally uh, uh, a revenue raising measure. There's nothing else. Now, let's, uh, I've already answered the five trillion dollar question that this is that's in the logic of compound growth so that's not something that you know we need to worry too much about it's going to happen how can bureaucrats play a huge role post this crisis to recover the economy well i think uh, it's, it's not so much the bureaucrats uh, it's as much the bureaucrats are not the investors the investors are you know private companies public sector companies um, and i think uh, the bureaucracy has done well in managing uh, the crisis. Uh, I think India has uh, always been known as an expert in managing crisis. We are experts at creating crisis. We are also ma experts at managing crisis. And I wouldn't put too much blame on the bureaucracy, having been part of the bureaucracy myself for so many years and looking at the bureaucracy uh, from the outside as well. I think uh, the bureaucracy in India uh, is uh, given uh, uh, you know, a bum rap, as they say. It's become they used as an alibi, a convenient punching bag. But uh, I think uh, the bureaucracy has delivered when the political leadership has been clear, determined, uh, and uh, has been focused. And I think that's the real lesson that we draw. Can the Indian economy, along with its soft power, lead the global economy in the not so distant future? Well, uh, I think it's difficult to say. I think uh, uh, the US economy is still very important, 25% of world output. Uh, China is playing a more important role, uh, but I don't know whether the Chinese uh, role is going to continue the way it is because uh, clearly, you know, uh, post COVID, uh, people are more suspicious of the Chinese than they ever were. <clears throat> and we, of course, have reason to be even more suspicious after what not only COVID-19 and after what the Chinese uh, have done or doing in Ladakh. So uh, I think the Indian economy uh, has soft power. Certainly, we should use that soft power. <coughs> we have tremendous soft power. Uh, but ultimately, you know, soft power leads you uh, up to a point. Ultimately, you have to provide services, manufacture products that are internationally competitive. And if you're internationally competitive, people will buy from you. You have to have infrastructure. Uh, you have to deliver on time. And you have to have uh, a reputation uh, for, for quality. And I think that's where, for example, the Japanese uh, turned around their economy in the 50s and 60s. I have interest in economics. Uh, can I take economics as an optional subject? Yes, I think you should take economics. If you're interested in economics, you should take it. I think uh, I would also say that uh, you should be good in mathematics. I don't think, you know, increasingly economics is becoming very mathematical as well. So I would not uh, recommend you to take up economics unless you are uh, also uh, have an interest or an aptitude for mathematics. Uh, I think both of them go together. Uh, I think it's very important to have a grounding in, in mathematics. Uh, what's the future of our aviation sector? Well, it uh, looks bleak right now. 
uh, all flights uh, have been put on hold. They've been bankrupt. See, Skinfisher has become bankrupt. Um, uh, Air India has been bankrupt. Jet has gone into bankruptcy. So let's see. I mean, the aviation sector, very, very uncertain times. And uh, for the next four or five months, at least, I don't see normalcy returning to the aviation sector. But uh, there has been an aviation boom in India over the last decade or so. New routes have been opened up. Uh, Low-cost carriers like Indigo and Go and Spice came up. So, you know, there was a uh, somebody who told me, Hawaii, Hawaii Chappal to Hawaii Jahaj. People were all sorts, you know, people, the common man was flying. I think. Uh, so let's see. I mean, I don't know how long this uh, revival of the aviation sector is going to take. Is government spending also a criteria? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in the pre-COVID-19, uh, government spending uh, was critical. Post-COVID-19, it's going to be absolutely critical. Uh, ultimately, you know, government has to spend. But the nature of spending is important. What does it spend on? Uh, does, it, does it invest? Uh, or does it, you know, is it used for wasteful expenditure, uh, vanity expenditure? Uh, or is it for expenditure that yields productive returns? So government spending is very important. And I think there should be a debate in this country, a more informed debate in this country on the nature of government spending. Uh, impact of COVID-19 on the informal sector? Well, the informal sector has been virtually destroyed. Uh, in fact, not only the MSME sector, when we say of MSME, this is an organized MSME sector, but the impact, the informal sector, uh, informal trade, <coughs> unorganized sector, informal sector has been virtually destroyed. And I don't know how uh, they are going to revive. I think uh, that, you know, the MSME package has been announced by the government. But these are MSMEs, relatively organized, small scale, relatively organized, medium scale uh, industry. But the informal sector is really informal. Uh, and uh, there, I think, uh, first demonetization killed them. Then GST added to their burden. And now they have COVID. So I think it's uh, a triple, triple bashing the informal sector has got. It first demonetization in November 16. Then GST in July 17, and now COVID 19 in March 19. So, this uh, very, very, very important question uh, what will happen to the informal sector? Frankly, uh, the informal sector might just disappear, for all that I know, unless we take steps to revive it. Are we really doing enough to ensure rise in consumption? Well, uh, I think the uh, government has announced a large number of measures. These are more medium term confidence building measures. Uh, but I think, uh, as I said, uh, you know, there are two sides to this. There is a revival side and there is a survival side. <clears throat> right now, people are not worried so much about revival as much as survival. And survival comes through cash transfers. Survival comes through uh, Mahatma Gandhi Narega type of jobs which provide instant uh, financial assistance. It comes by implementation of the National Food Security Act, you know, which gives you access to food, uh, basic uh, commodities, rice, wheat, dal, sugar. So uh, I think, yes, I mean, will consumption rise? I think 2020, 21 <coughs> consumption may still be uh, muted in new quam, but we are all expecting that consumption is going to rise the year after. Uh, well, we can come out of the crisis. Uh, there are, you know, different. There are no shortage of ideas, no shortage of advisors. Uh, we can, we, we have to come out of the crisis. A government spending is certainly one way of coming out of the crisis. Uh, private investment has to has to revive. Without a revival of private investment, uh, it's going to be difficult. But it's important to recognize that the Indian economy was decelerating, as I mentioned to you. Uh, uh, for six quarters, even before this COVID crisis. So the COVID crisis has accentuated it. So let's see what happens. Uh, could you think of boost the Indian economy? Well, Indian economy, you know, as I said, this question is on Atmanian per package. Uh, frankly, as I said, from 1950 onwards, <coughs> Indian economic policy was Atmanian per policy, you know, self-reliance and industry. 
That's how we set up all the giant public sector companies. Uh, we set up steel plants, fertilizer plants, refineries, aluminum plants. I mean, these are all self-reliance. Uh, in fact, one criticism of economists is that we did too much self-reliance and that we did not take advantages of uh, international trade. So from 1950 onwards, self-reliance and Atmanirvan, Bharat has always been self-reliance in uh, agriculture, for example. Self, uh, we don't import much wheat, we don't import rice, we import pulses, but we don't import basic commodities like we used to. Uh, certainly in terms of resources, foreign investment is, uh, you know, maybe less than 7-8% of total amount of resources. So, uh, you know, Indian policy has always been self-reliance, so nothing new about the self-reliance in Indian economic policy. In fact, as I said, there have been economists who have blamed Indian economy for being for taking self-reliance too much. Uh, <laughs> it's ironical now that we are now rediscovering the virtues of self-reliance. We should invest more in the clearing of the poverty. No, we should invest more. We should invest more in uh, infrastructure. Uh, we should certainly invest, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the biggest priority is investment in health. I think that's the most single most important uh, area that should uh, demand our attention. As I said uh, earlier on, wealth is not necessarily health, but health is definitely wealth. And I think that's the real message that we, we need to carry out from this crisis. <clears throat> Which is better, giving people below a certain level of income some money? Well, direct transfer, direct cash transfer for the for the poor, provided you can identify them, provided you ensure that there are no leakages. Uh, I think is is a good step. <laughs> you must have read in the newspapers that even the United States, 1.4 billion dollars uh, of cash transfer has gone to people uh, who are dead. So even in a country like the U.S. Uh, they have, uh, you know, given cash uh, to people who don't exist. So cash transfers to real people is good, not to ghosts. Uh, I've spoken about this. Uh, I've already spoken of what initiative should be taken, uh, lurching slowdown. Well, yes, I mean, there is this question about the slowdown. It is, uh, the, the COVID slowdown is, uh, as I said, not new. There was a pre-COVID slowdown. And what the COVID has done is, is accelerated and deepened the slowdown. That is an important fact for, for students of economics to appreciate and acknowledge. Uh, I've already answered this question on self-reliance being always, uh, uh, yeah, there are no new jobs. Therefore, therefore, how will there be consumption? Very good point. You can consume only if you're earning. And you can earn only if you have a job. So we really have to go back and look at the revival of the MSME sector. Uh, we have to look at cash transfers for the vulnerable sections of the population. Uh, and uh, this is one way uh, of, uh, of, of generating and reviving the consumption engine. Remember, the consumption engine, investment engine, and a trade engine. All three engines have to kick for the economy to get moving once again. <clears throat> well, the pandemic uh, uh, has been largely uh, in, the, in the urban areas. The urban areas have been affected very badly. Uh, it's not so bad in rural India as yet. Uh, but let's keep our fingers crossed. Agriculture has not been as uh, adversely affected as industry. And that's why we are seeing whatever growth we are seeing in India is not because of industry, is not because of services. It's because of agriculture. Uh, the rains have been good. Uh, the price supports uh, have been announced. Uh, and I think, as I said in the beginning, uh, this economic uh, stagnation, uh, unlike previous stagnations, is not an agriculture-driven stagnation. It's an industry and services and export-driven stagnation. <clears throat> I think uh, I've come to the end. It's exactly 11.45. And therefore, uh, let me, I have to stop here right now, I think. So uh, let me say once again that this has been a very useful, uh, very uh, practical 
and a very, I mean, some of the questions, I wish we had had more time so that I could answer more of these questions. I like to wish each and every one of you all the very best. Uh, and I hope that you are successful uh, in the examination that you will take. Meanwhile, I stay safe uh, and best wishes to tide over this crisis. Thank you very much.